<laughs> he disappears into the did you see that he has got the yeah yeah and he disappears into the aneurysm and comes back yeah it's quite impressive uh, that uh, he always has this picture with the uh on arterial tree uh, and, uh, very, and uh, I'm, I'm very impressed that he you know he's always keen to learn it's quite an uh, inspiration to be honest so, so. Yeah. it's like as you always say you know you can bring the horse to the water with a horse drinks <laughs> or not is a question for the horse to decide uh, uh, <coughs> morning doctor morning doctor parak uh, good morning good morning morning dr narain good morning How are you? dr very well thank you very well yourself very well, very well. i am very well very well good it's afternoon yeah. in india mumbai oh it is good yes yes, yes. looking Look. forward for your talks i i must congratulate for your hard work oh thank you thank you dr pak uh, dr. you are doing wonderful i, I thank you i think uh, i think to be honest i think in 2020 all the major societies will go electronic i think i think you know i think i have i hope i have done in terms of introducing the webinar systems to many people in the senior ranks but i think um, the two, i think to the, the the all the societies i think they will go to electronic system yeah but electronic is just only one part you know you know we always need to have these uh, personal interactions so uh, i like I electronic but uh, sitting for four hours or five hours that's certainly enough sit uh, at least at my age and looking at the screen getting eye problems and all yeah. the other things because you don't don't uh, close your eyes all the exactly. time and yeah. so you look at the screen and So my wife is doing a lot of these things and uh, yeah. she interpreting she has many many uh, conferences to do by screen and it's awful yes i think uh, you absolutely right but i think until the i don't know when this covid thing business is going to finish so uh, what do you call uh, until then uh, uh, i hope it keeps as a hybrid so it's now 8:30 so i will uh, uh, say good morning <coughs> Good morning everyone thank you very much for coming to the third day of this international uh, neurosurgery webinar course or conference in fact we have had uh, free papers and uh, uh, lectures from esteemed uh, neurosurgeons from around the world uh, today we have another very uh, uh, packed as well as a, a fantastic program uh, and this is our final day and uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, professor um, maximilian macdon he's a great friend of the list uh, but uh, he was the pro- professor and chairman of the prestigious department of neurosurgery in keel and he's a emeritus professor there professor there he has been active in uh, neurosurgery um, throughout his career until now and uh, he is a great friend of uh, uh many countries uh, he's a, he's a very internationalist as i as as anyone as i know and uh, he is a like all uh, german professors they are master surgeons in every area but he's uh, has a particular interest in functional neurosurgery so professor mcdon is uh, going to uh, talk to us about uh, deep brain stimulation and we are we are now uh, thank you very much professor Thank you Nari for this kind of introduction and thank you for inviting me again it's my great pleasure to be with this course and I've been very very much impressed about what you have put on for the two days and uh, I wish you all the best for this day and for the next days also to the audience so I want to talk a little bit about deep brain stimulation and uh, for parkinson's disease mainly and uh, if since there are many residents obviously here i would like to make a little point, personal point there are prerequisites for functional neurosurgeon which also are true for general neurosurgeon but particularly for a functional neurosurgeon i think we have a lot of modern technologies developing over the recent years which are fascinating and one has to be very much impressed about them they want to have to learn and improve them but still with all the technology which is offered which can be developed which is offered by the industry we as neurosurgeons have to be modest we need a team approach and uh, everyone is involved in the tre- in the treatment but there needs to be a leader someone who has really to take the responsibility 
And when we talk to the patient, you have to be honest. You teach your patients, talk to them what you would, what you can offer to them, but you also have to learn from your patients. That's also very, very important. And you have to learn to go abroad for meetings and learn from uh, other colleagues. And when you start uh, doing a functional neurosurgery, every case, or if you want to go into a career with neuro with uh, functional neurosurgery, you have to be very careful and slow and better think twice than think too fast. And since it's an evolving field, you have to let others do the mistakes, think about it, think of other possibilities as well, like uh, stimulation versus lesioning. Every, everyone is talking about lesioning nowadays, but you have to also think about stimulation and particularly uh, depending on the countries where you're located. <clears throat> so we have to see both possibilities. Neurosurgical therapy of movement disorders has a long career, more than 70 years now. Myers, he started with a surgical disruption of these fibers, which influence rigor and tremor. And everything really started with Spiegel and Weiss's developing the stereoencephalotum back in 1947. Lexel, Tara, and many other from other countries, Sweden, uh, France, uh, Japan, Germany, and again, France. So this is the first system which has been developed by Spiegel and Weiss many years ago. This has certainly been refined, but that's a basic. So there were many, many stereotactic operations performed, which were lesions, but they taught us a lot. They taught us very much about the functional anatomy of the basal ganglia area. And all of a sudden there was a development of L-DOPA and the agonists and other medications came in too. So there was a breakdown in stereotactic surgery, which uh, then recovered when deep brain stimulation, another technology was developed in the 80s, early 80s, and then really got off in the mid, mid 80s, early 90s and further on. So it's a long development. Spiegel and Weiss, they developed the stereoencephalotum. You see Henry Weiss here in this picture and everything was on the basal ganglia surgery. So everything was very close to the third ventricle, uh, the lateral ventricle, but to the third ventricle for Raman of Monroe and all the other things. They were, the, the ventricles were filled initially with air or with the contrast medium, mostly with air. And from there, they calculated very carefully the, the situation where the basal ganglia were located. So neurosurgical therapy of movement disorders started with destruction. Now there are rare indications uh, when it is not possible to perform uh, stimulation procedures, but uh, nowadays coming back again as controlled lesion with a high focus ultrasound, for example. Stimulation is a method of choice presently. And then we have other possibilities also, which came up with augmentation, stem cell injections and other factor injections. And one has to be very much, it's, it's still a moving field. So there are going to be methods of the futures. Target points are in the basal ganglia, VAM, GPI, globus pallidus internus, subthalamic nucleus, which is the working horse, no, horse nowadays for neurosurgeons and sooner and certa close to the uh, STN or target fibers between the nuclei. So uh, we have the points, we have the fibers, and we have to be very careful what we see when we perform stimulation, when we think about doing what kind of surgery. Someone who is always credited, that's Professor Ben Abid, who was a good friend of mine from Grenoble, who was very active in the field. There was also many, many others before him and parallel to him, like Professor Siegfried from Zurich, I was whom I've been working back in 73 when I started my neurosurgery career in, in Zurich uh, with Professor Yasha Giel, and that's me when I was still young, and that's one of my uh, colleagues. So uh, we know that from the, from the epidemiology, with increasing age, we have an increasing risk and cumulative incidences in this aging population of developing Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's and uh, so also the interest for these uh, brain stimulation techniques have increased over recent years. As you see here, that's a curve for deep brain stimulation from a paper from Cabrera, 2014 has even overtaken a number of publications for transcranial magnetic stimulation with us. So there are a couple of techniques, DBS, TMS and direct cortical stimulation as well. DBS publications as uh, summarized by Lozani and Lozano and Lipner a couple of years ago started in the 80s. And then there came many trials like STN, DBS and use to treat Parkinson's was allowed. 
and then came the approval of the FDA for DBS and essential tremor Tourette syndrome and then for Parkinson's only DBS for approval and then dystonia so a couple of uh, trials and depression other other indications came depression Alt uh, Alzheimer's disease and so on so there's still evolving technology is evolving indication and we have to be very very careful to what to talk, talk to the patients and what to suggest to them and uh, take the entire patient also take the family into consideration when you want to do something now dbs for parkinson's disease that's one of the slides which one of my former uh, students now Professor Hamel from, from Hamburg gave to me 2019 is the most investigated therapy for Parkinson's disease. However, he says there's no increase in efficacy in the last 20 years. So we have to improve on this. Increase in efficacy should not be expected. Limitations of the deep terrain simulation persist, which is a kind of uh, realistic, maybe a little bit pessimistic uh, perspective. But in hand, we can enhance the therapy when we try to avoid the complications and the adverse events. So very much about this. These are the basics here, the basal ganglia area, you see the capsula interna, you see the basal ganglia, and close to the third ventricle, to the lateral ventricles, that's the area which we like to target. And everything is uh, explained, well explained by the DeLong uh, theory the normal state of the interaction between the cerebral cortex, the striatum, globus pallidus externus, uh, <coughs> globus pallidus internus, uh, SDN, and the thalamus. So we have excitatory, inhibitory, and modulatory, uh, modulatory pathways which interact in a normal state. And then in the Parkinsonian state, we have more inhibition from the striatum to the GPE. We have more inhibition from the GPI to the thalamus, and we interact and more excitation between the thalam, uh, STN and the GPI. So we, uh, this can also be uh, shown differently. We have this motor circuit for Parkinson's dystonia. You see this part of the area is the same anatomy. And then we have the limbic circuit, which is very much intermingled with the motor circuit, as you see here, Tourette syndrome, both and OCD depression. And we are only talking about Parkinson's disease. These. So the 3D anatomy of the basal ganglia is taken from YouTube. You see everything is centered around the ventricular system. So we have to start with the ventricular system. Everything is based on the, on the line between the anterior and the posterior commissure. And uh, the coordinates of the targets based on the mid ACPC line are the, for the subthalamic nucleus, which is the main target, which is the working horse, as I mentioned, for Parkinson's. These are in the literature, and then we have the GPI. They are fixed, but I'll show you uh, some modifications as well. And we have the GPI, which is the working horse for dystonia and then uh, ventromedialis nucleus for tremor. And these are, these are not necessarily only dystonia, dystonia, but also for dystonic components of Morbus Parkinson. And we could discuss whether we should go to the SDN regular or go to the GPI. So both options are possible, similar for the nucleus ventralis intermediate for the tremor. So again, the ACPC line is shown on the standard MRI scan and the mid ACPC and from there we go for these targets. And that's where we would like to put our electrodes medial to the capsular interna in this area here somewhere down to the STN or GPI. And so we have some modifications of this. From our series, we have done now more than 1,000 patients over the last 20 years. So we have a summary uh, with 760 patients. We, as you see, and the, the numbers have not changed dramatically or the percentage has not changed. Majority of those patients have been treated with, uh, for Parkinson's disease, some 126 for dystonia, essential tremor, and, and the rare indications like myoclonia, sunk, and with so others. So I'll talk mostly about Parkinson's. Inclusion criteria for Parkinson's uh, patients for deep brain simulation. It should be the idiopathic uh, Parkinson's disease, which is conservatively treated, which has a, leads to a poor quality of life with all the medication. And if the patients have to take uh, all these medications with rebound phenomena, and then they come and say, well, is there something better we can get from treatment? 
so they undergo neurological evaluation, optimization, or the treatment, they still have a poor quality of life, and then they get this DOPA test with neurology, positive L-DOPA test predicts the chance of recovery of their quality of life, of their movements, uh, which can be expected from surgery approximately. And they have to be in good general health. So very old man, very old lady, which has a poor medical health, severe brain atrophy, macroangiopathy, dementia, severe frontal lobe dysfunction, and so on, severe uncontrollable internal diseases, heart disease, all the other things, or anticoagulant therapy, immune suppressions. These are no candidates for surgery. And what is also very important, depending on where you are located, if you have uh, no good follow-up possibilities for the patient, so if the patient lives in distant rural areas, that's certainly a rather contraindication against these uh, fascinating technologies of deep brain stimulation because they need a very close look up also further down the career. It's very important to tell the patients it's better sometimes to perform just the lesioning in these patients instead of thinking about deep brain stimulation if you cannot follow the patient very well. And, and so you have to take the responsibility for the patient. It's very important to explain this to him or to her. So the clinical DBS effect can be multifactorial. We have, we have these nuclei, we, so we put in a, a, an electrode and we get everything, into, we get some interaction with the soma, with the dendrites, with the axon, and this needs to be worked out to depend on the physical properties and uh, conductivity and all the things of this uh, brain tissue around this. McIntyre here has shown nicely you see that's the STN. We have some effect in the STN itself, but we also have other effects in the areas around. So it's uh, it's not always a regular uh, bulb-shaped uh, effectivity, but it's always somehow distorted, and we have to think how to improve this. I've shown this the Schaltenbrand Warren Atlas as a basis uh, with the coronal section. We there are also up other atlases like the Montreal Neurolog Neurological Institute, which is an electronic atlas nowadays created. And you see from publications uh, from 2017, they are uh, probabilistic conversion of these electrodes in the SGN for Parkinson's patients for dystonia in other areas between the GPI and GPE and essential tremor. So there are modifications of this. Uh, of these uh, electrode positions uh, collected from various patients, from huge uh, numbers of patients, and to, to make positioning of the electrodes easier and also to better understand what the effect of the stimulation could be preoperative, but also afterwards what happened to these patients. Because one always has to be aware that the, we have structural connectivities between like the STN, for example, or as you see here, we have a motor part in anterior, we have a door, uh, and, and we have a limbic part of the STN of the thalamic nucleus. So we have to be aware where other, other effects occur when we stimulate down in the basal ganglia. It's very important. So when we want to have the indication, we have to ask the right question, define the clinical situation, what are the deficits, what are the problems and where do they come from? This is usually done by neurology. And then you, we talk together with neurology and neurosurgery, whether we can improve by doing deep brain stimulation. We have to find the right targets to stimulate. We started with the nuclei. Now we think also about the interactions between various nuclei. So we go from nuclei to fibers. And then we have to perform the right stimulation to discuss when to perform surgery. So at which stage of the disease, we can do it very, very early nowadays, but uh, we it's always have to discuss with the patient. He has to take the burden of his further life uh, with some battery, with some implants in there, whether he really would like to have this. So it's a long discussion and we need to be caref very careful about uh, putting the risk or the burden of uh, implants onto the patient. That's a benefit, but it's also it's a burden also for the patient sometimes. I'll show you later pictures. So cooperation between neurology and neurosurgery is very important. 
And then we have the instruments. We have to design the electrodes, the cooperation between your surgery industry. And then we have the parameters, simulation parameters. And at the moment, many people are talking about closed circuits for Parkinson's disease as has been developed for epilepsy, for example. How to find the right target clinical diagnosis, the leading symptoms, it's very simple. We go for the STN because we know it's a very small nuclei which we can target very, very carefully. We use uh, MRI with special sequences. We define the target according to coordinates which are modified according to anatomy of the vessel. And the ventricles, we go with the Ben's gun, ben, uh, Benabit's gun, three to five trajectories. We go down uh, to do with a microelectrode recording. That's our technology, that's our technique, uh, which has been disputed. We still rely to it. We one to three to five trajectories. And when we go upward with the microelectrode, we stimulate that through the microelectrodes and define the best stimulation site. And then we place the electrode down at this area and again, test the effect of the macro electrode, which is carefully fixed to the skull. And, we, and I, when you look at these uh, <coughs> figures, there was a, uh, once at an expert meeting, he asked the experts where they would, where they would, uh, where they would place their electrodes. And you see that the large variability here in the STN most of them, obviously, we will place them in the dorsal part, just in the motor part of the STN. But there are also variations about this. So there are, you have to be very careful about when you listen. We have these standards electrodes, but that's not really so true. We have done about 50 patients a year, 50 to 70 patients. Sometimes we started, as I mentioned, in 99 very, very carefully. And then uh, young people took over and they're still doing a lot of deep brain simulations. So data ex acquisition is done in the other, usually we have done it under general anesthesia to have the patient move, moving free to have really good, uh, good MRI scans and with the various techniques, various sequences. So we can define the STN very carefully here. We can define the trajectory also on the contrast to be sure that we are out lateral from the, from the ventricle, that we don't touch any, any vessels here, superficial or even deep ones to prevent postoperative hemorrhage or so. And on the basis of the ACPC line, which is nicely shown here, we can see, we can then define the targets and go for deep burn simulation. Again, ACPC, as you can see here, which I had shown you in the model. So we have targets which are visible in the MRI scan, like the STN. You see that from the, from the uh, coloring, and then we have the GPI where we can use the optic track here yeah, again as landmark in the coronal section, which, and then we have the nuclear VIM, we have the stereotactic coordinates and uh, <coughs> go further. So microelectrode recording long time ago, one of our first patients in 99 or to, to early 2000. So we have this old system, homemade system. Now we have Leadpoint and other companies also from, from Atronic, other companies have similar systems or with a stereotactic frame. We use the ZD frame, which we also use for stereotactic biopsies. That's very helpful. We can define the borders of the STN by the, as you see here, that's the STN, STN, STN with this irregular burst like discharges and high background noise. So it's very typical when you listen to it under the, under the, when you underpass and then we, then we see how long we can go through the STN or like this one. And then again, we listen very carefully when we go through the STN, the substance that I got has a different, has a tonic regular discharge pattern. We know we are through the STN. So then we go back and stimulate where we would like to have the best placement of the electrode. So it's very important to have a very good uh, positioning as good as possible positioning of the electrode because we have this motor area and we have this limbic part of the thalamic nucleus, which obviously does not lie completely free in the brain, but we have areas which are important also. Where we are too dorsally, we have the aggressive behavior, interrupted simulation of the triangle of Sano, or we have the impression of anxiety when we go to the substance Niger, or when we go to the limbic, we have compulsion. And, uh, and then we also have psychiatric side effects like irre irresistible laughing possibility. 
So with these uh, the, the optimal contact areas, and when we go further, when we have gone through, we have many options for the neurologist to stimulate light on the traditional quadripolar electrode or metronic like 30, 30, 3389, we have the possibility to stimulate like this. So it's a simple, uh, simple setup in neurosurgery and with it's uh, look through, we have a close cooperation with neurologists when they perform the testing also, as you can see here, and here I'm doing surgery myself, but it's always better to have uh, four neurosurgical eyes because it's possible to make some mistakes and also for learning and controlling each other, it's good to have a four eye principle if it's possible to do it. So it uh, helps them. Post-operative stereotactic uh, X-ray show the nice placement of the electrodes which is obviously not mandatory. And then we can correlate the electrode placement to a stereotactic atlas just only to verify that we are really where we wanted to go. So after deeper and stimulation, we have slow change of medication versus stimulation battery exchange after a few years. And then care of patients is very important. Long-term care is not only neurology, but also neurosurgery. We know that TBS suppresses the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's prolongs the duration of on phases, improves quality of life, allows reduction of medical therapy and side effects. And like uh, what now should, should, should work, I should show you some pictures, some, some videos, a patient with a, uh, with a akinetic uh, Parkinson. So the akinesia component was uh, very severe in this patient. She had difficulties moving, really moving her fist and uh, look at her how she stands like this it's very very difficult she so she has a high risk of falling and hopefully it works uh, for the next so when i go here for this uh, so You see after the operation, she's still not on stimulation, stim off. So there has been a placement effect which lasts for some time. So these, some kind of lesioning has occurred. And when you look at how she moves her uh, legs, oh, she should do that now. And then she tries to get up. She gets up quite well already. And she's much better off now than before surgery. Okay, and then we have the uh, stim on effect. Uh, wait a second. No. So she's much better on now with the finger tapping. And you'll see also when she's going to walk. So it has been one of our very early patients back in 99. <clears throat> so akinesia has dramatically improved which is very helpful for her daily life. And she is much better able now to walk, stand, get up and, and walk as you can see. And when you compare how she was uh, unable to control her movement, it's much better now. Okay, so this summarizes in uh, quality of life improvement. And we have done this early STEM study, which had been published back in 2013. So we see the dramatic improvement of the Parkinson's disease quality of life, 39. Summary index, 26%, even in patients who had uh, improved completely optimized medical therapy. So we have improvement of these uh, by 20, uh, 26%, which is dramatic for the quality of life. You see PDQ summary, 26%. Mobility activities of daily living have dramatically improved as well as emotional well-being and stigma. Body discomfort to slight cognition has not really improved. There has been also some 
uh, not so much uh, communication has not improved either. What one has to be very much aware about the serious adverse events in the neurostimulation group. There were two suicides, life threatening events in, in 14 related to medication or stimulation worsening of mobilities. And these are the, the, the official figures in this publication. When one listens to the talks by my very good friend, Dr. Marvan Harris, who recently also gave his talk on ethics on deeper and stimulation, one wonders whether these figures are really true, whether these are the only one figures or whether they are higher complications or serious adverse events. And one has to read through those articles very carefully and to understand everything also behind the lines maybe. So other possibilities are frame-based or non-frame based. That's a discussion. We usually use the frame base. Uh, there is a clear point system brought out by the industry when you can work in the, within the MRI scan and perform immediate control of how you place the electrodes with this pivot point area. The other improvements at the standard electrode, as you can see here, the quadra, quadripolar metronic electrode, we have worked with one uh, company to improve uh, steering the field by multiple electrodes, like here, 64 electrodes steering the field so that one targets only the STN and not the areas around, like here, the capsule antenna, for example. And this gives uh, additional freedom for the neurologist or the neurosurgeon to better place the electrode and also to better stimulate, but also brought, uh, brings a lot of problems too, because it's a lot of, uh, a lot of stimulation business needs to be done, very tef, careful titrate, titration of the stimulation effect, and, but uh, maybe very helpful in the future. And from this, there have been a development of many <clears throat> different electrodes. We had the standard electrode, which has, now we have the Aliva electrode, which you see here, at the two, two normal uh, circular electrodes. Uh, and then we have this uh, division into three segments. And there are also variations in Boston Scientific and Jules like this, and that's the other which I talked about. <clears throat> so there are many possibilities to shape the electrical field by this computer technology, which it really has, that's the, the thought. And then it really needs to be applied in human and in patients with or computational modeling methods. And, uh, but uh, this will definitely benefits for the patient. We, how can we further optimize the target? We can integrate other, other modalities like uh, fiber tracts into the planning, as you can see here from the Freiburg group a couple of years ago. So to see whether we really hit very close to the, to the pyramidal tract, we can visualize it and uh, to try to be aware of it. And we can, with these methods, we can also target other areas as well. We know we can simulate the brain, but it, it's a network. A certain We can simulate it at certain nodes and we have to have a very careful follow-up of patients for additional effects. Hardware-associated complications need to be discussed with the patients before, and that's our series. We have 15, 16% of complications in the multiple sclerosis patients. These are the very slim, very slim, very sick patients. So this is explainable. We have also in Parkinson's about 7%, essential tremor and dystonia slightly less. So that's again from Dr. Hamels, uh, they should be these uh, complications or adverse events should be based on an analysis on patient years for long-term follow-up. And that's a very busy, uh, busy slide because you put all the complications into adverse events. And you see there's a whole variability of the, of the, of the, from the different series which have been published over the recent 20 years or so. So uh, you can give these uh, numbers to the patient to select where he should go or where he or she should go, but it's better to do a good job and try to be as good as possible and to be as honest as possible. So per patient or per, uh, per from the meta-analysis of uh, 103 publications, hardware removal was necessary per patient year two and a half to 3%. That's quite a number, number and also lead revisions between three and 4%. Now we have from the industry, we've got, these are the big clumsy things, which in the, the uh, 
IPG, including the battery, they became much slimmer when we have, uh, when they left the battery off and just only put the electrodes in and some recharging possibilities. So is it really good? It needs to be discussed with the patient. That's the initial picture, which many of you certainly know. And then we have 10 years later, we have this wide bed variation. So it's very important, very difficult for neurosurgeons or also for neurologists to stick with uh, to understand all these different different systems, we have to stick to one or two systems at maximum really to understand the benefits, the problems of this, and then uh, advise our patients which system they should get. It's very difficult. I skipped this one. Long-term problems. It's very important one has to take care of these patients because uh, <clears throat> such a such a elect such a IPG placed in the uh, right has a high risk of developed infection. So as soon as there is some problem, the patient should be advised to come to his, see his neurosurgeon, not only stay with his home physician, but go to the neurosurgeon to see whether they should be like here, the, the cables have been, have moved somewhere and somehow, and that's the risky area. So the patient risks to leave, to lose his, his uh, IPG and uh, then he may really run into trouble. Open questions remain DVS versus lesioning. This depends on the situation, on the local situation. As I mentioned, when patients are far away from the treating neurosurgeon it's, or neurologist, it's better to do lesioning because then once you have done the treatment, the patient can be left alone and has done a good job and you have done a good job. Also financial burden in Germany, this costs about 20,000 euros and uh, slightly higher nowadays. Then we need neurology follow-up complications a long course of different simulation needs to be taken care of. Discussion about target SGN versus GPI. GPI was the first after the VAM for Parkinson's and then SGN because it's a small target which can be nicely targeted and then some a discussion about awake surgery versus a sleep surgery. We have done Parkinson's, we have done in awake surgery. Dystonia, we've always done in a sleep surgery. So <clears throat> to, we don't need the patient to, and, and there's a higher risk of, uh, of complications when he moves to a dystonic movement. So Parkinson's usually we do awake surgery to have cooperation with the patient. It's very, very important if this is a good message, empty battery, broken hardware, infected hardware. We create a dependency on the system for patients with Parkinson's disease. Once we have implanted this uh, DBS system, this can be life-threatening. Marvin Harris has published about it. We have published about this, about death or high complications after when the patient comes too late with an empty battery <laughs> with a broken hardware. To the patient, so it's a high risk. Dystonia, we have other possibilities. Post stroke dystonia, I just only show you one patient before surgery and after surgery. You see, before surgery has very bad positioning. And once we just a couple of days after surgery, so, so then we can have very good good uh, effects of deep brain simulation in this patient. Obviously, it has been a unilateral positioning and uh, tremor. VIM is again via uh, awake surgery. And that's a patient with uh, tremor, thalamic tremor before surgery. He's very slim, as you see, because he has problems eating, drinking. Okay, and then I will just show how it did, how he did after surgery. You see, one week after DBS, steady hand and okay. So the patient can benefit from this kind of surgery. But as I started my talk, modern technologies are fascinating. We still have to be very modest. We have to be very, very honest, learn from our patients, uh, learn from other colleagues. Be careful, think about it. 
before we do some indication, think about other other possibilities and uh, depending on this localization where you where you are located localized uh, stimulate or lesion but be very careful for your patient do what you think you can do best you have to be very careful about ethics of medical practice the brain as you can see here on the key further we have a shipyard where we build a lot of submarines the brain is very similar to a submarine when you just only look at the surface, it looks very nice. If you would like to look very carefully into the submarine, you have to take it out. That is not possible with the brain, obviously, but we can, uh, <clears throat> can have many, many possibilities to evaluate the brain function uh, invasively, non-invasively, invasively, and we have to try to do the best for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. That's about it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahdon. It was him. Uh, uh, excellent uh, lecture. Really, I found it very useful. Uh, I don't do functional neurosurgery, uh, and but uh, so you know, I really understood the whole lecture very well. Uh, first of all, I will open to any questions to the audience. Um, let's see uh, what do you call. Uh, I think I got a question from. Um, uh, Mr. Giorgio Zilidis, he's uh, finished his uh, fellowship in functional neurosurgery at Ox Oxford. Um, he's asking, uh, what do you think about MRI guided, highly focused ultrasound to create lesions for tremor? Thanks. Well, of course, I could have, I could have also included this one in my talk. Uh, that's a very modern technology, but I was uh, asked on to talk only about Parkinson's disease, so sure. I did not include this one in. Sure. Uh, when uh, when I was still chairman of the department, there was a couple of publications coming out from, uh, they started with a high-focused ultrasound uh, in Boston. My Peter Black and, and uh, his group, they started with this together with radiology, Ferenc Joles with GE, and we were very much interested. So at the beginning, these high-focused ultrasounds started with outside of the brain, like uh, doing this lesioning, uh, burning away some some uh, no uh, some lumps in the in in the breast, which I would say, and then afterwards having overcome all the problems with the uh, attenuation coefficient and all these things in the in the skull, they also developed this for for brain surgery, and they in the mid 2010s and the second mid part of the of this decade. Well, last decade, they had uh, published first publications from Korea and others came out. So we are looking also for essential tremor. And, we, and then uh, after I left, my, my successor, he succeeded in getting one of the machines also to Kiel. And I could have included some, some uh, patients in this one from this year. And they seem to have very good effect for, for essential tremor because when you go for the VM, you can, you can treat these patients non-invasively in the MRI machine, but uh, as I mentioned, I was asked to talk only about uh, about this uh, Parkinson's, so I didn't include those. Not that very helpful. Thanks. We have Thank to be aware that uh, that's the advantage about over simple lesioning is that you can control it with MRI scan. You see how much uh, temperature you apply to what you to about, apply to the nucleus. And then you can really see that you have a good benefit for the patient. You can test him intraoperatively in the machine, as we do also, and you can test it and, and see what is the benefit. And obviously, there is some edema around the lesion, which you create, so the effect goes away, but it can be repeated also after some time if necessary. So definitely it's coming out. We have to see what's, whether it is bilaterally. We usually do it only one side in one time, and then the patient would come back for, if he has a bilateral tremor, would come back again another time for the second side. That's an advantage. Thank you, Professor. Just on that, uh, 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 in terms of the, the risk of hemorrhages with the, putting the uh, electrodes in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in epilepsy surgery, they do the contrast enhanced scans and then they plan it. Is that how now in uh, functional? No, we, we always we always do the contrast enhanced scan. Okay. 
uh, to see. And we also have this diffusion weighted imaging. We have done susceptibility weighted imaging and to see whether it's a benefit for the, to reduce the number of, of hemorrhage, the risk of hemorrhage. But uh, when we place a microelectrode, but uh, uh, contrast enhances is as simple as is the best way. Thanks. Uh, I think um, one of the questions that for the people, neurosurgeons who are not functional neurosurgery, but we often get asked uh, by friends, family, etc., is that uh, if someone has Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, if they are eligible for the uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, how many years does this uh, benefit last for? Uh, and um, I think uh, because most people now think you know once you do it, it's it's lasts forever. And uh, but uh, uh, how much does it last for? And um, Thank you. Prof. Well, you know, it's a, it's a symptomatic treatment only. So <clears throat> it's a symptomatic treatment and the Parkinson's disease increases over time. So when we have this uh, decrease of quality of life of patients, we can improve on their quality of life, but uh, we cannot really completely make uh, stay stable on this on the same level all the time. So we can we can modify slightly by increasing the parameters and so on and so on, but we certainly cannot completely overcome the progression of the disease. But we have now patients who have been living for 10, 15, 20 years maximum. And a couple of them, I have seen them recently at a, at a symposium. A couple of them are still doing quite quite well, but uh, it's a big variation of the, of the subject. So we can improve. For the first couple of uh, five to ten years, certainly, and this gives a big benefit for them. But we cannot overcome the continuous degradation of the of the system, if you wish. Thanks. Um, well, uh, one more question from me. If any other questions, please uh, post it on the uh, chat box, and I'll bring you live. Um, I think in Britain, uh, one of the main problem has been how, the way I see it. It might not be the problem. Is that um, historically? the leading figures who have established functional neurosurgery and those centers are quite big and functional neurosurgery fellows are being produced but the problem has been because of the expense of the setting up the functional unit uh, and the referrals patients get referred initially to the neurologist and neurologists tend to refer to the people that they have been referring in the past and trying to establish uh, new functional neurosurgery departments really have not really taken off apart from the four units as far as I can know. And uh, uh, how can a new young neurosurgeon actually uh, uh, start a practice? But, um, and also the second part of the question is that and I was very interested in functional neurosurgery, but the department I got my residency didn't do functional neurosurgery. And I knew without actually being part of it for a long time, understanding the brain and everything, it's very difficult to get into functional neurosurgery. So for these two questions, for maybe the first one is for resident who's working in a department that doesn't have functional neurosurgery. And second, if you have become a, finished a fellowship, how to how to make your practice in a, in a field that are dominated by giants, thanks. Well, you know, it's, uh, I think that's why I mentioned, or that's why I strengthen so much the importance of the a team approach. You need a neurologist to work with at least one neurologist or more neurologists when you are a functional neurosurgeon. If you want to become a functional neurosurgeon with a busy practice, you have to to know what you do. You, so you have to learn it in a good fellowship program somewhere to stay there for one year or so, and at least and and see what they are doing, how they do, and be when you learn. Doing functional neurosurgery, you have to think whom you are working with in the future. So you have to get these neurologists interested in functional neurosurgery. When I was became chairman in 91 in Kiel, I came also from a department where they where we had no exposure to functional neurosurgery at all in Essen. We were, and I was very happy about microsurgery. I thought everything was good. We did not do stereotactic neurosurgery. We started in, in Kiel, we started with stereotactic neurosurgery. And then we got a neurologist who was very much for the Deutsche, who is one of the top movement is all a specialist at this time. And uh, so we said we should start uh, with deeper and stimulation. And we did a lot of training. We went abroad. We spent some time with Ben Abit. We had other people's working there and, and coming then to Kiel. So we get a nucleus. We had the idea we should start. 
And then it took, uh, for, I came to Kiel in 91, Dorsche came to Kiel in 94 or 95, and then in 99, only we did the first surgery. So it takes a long time of preparation and dedication to these uh, technologies if you really want to establish a good practice. Maybe you can do it nowadays, you can it faster, mm -hmm. but uh, don't do it too fast, just do mm -hmm. it, do it right. Thanks. Very <laughs> important. <laughs> And uh, good cooperation with neurologists and uh, have a good try to get a good balance with neurologists. Thanks. And I, I know in America you have they have these uh, Parkinson nurses. Mm -hmm. These neurosurgeons just put the needle in and say we have done a good job, and uh, the nurse takes care of it afterwards. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's really a good uh, good system. But, Thanks. Uh, uh, problem, uh, another question from me um, is that, uh, you know, the expense of the functional neurosurgery, the, the deep brain stimulator, and, uh, you know, do you see, foresee that it coming down with technology improving? And, and what's the hope for the uh, developing countries, which is you know, even difficult for Britain, Britain? Uh, and is it just a stimulation for developing con countries? Thanks. You know, I don't think I don't think it would come down. They always say, "Well, it gets more more difficult and easier to handle and better and everything." So we just need our prices. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have many companies competing, I'm not quite sure how how they make their prices. Like uh, we have been working with the Philips Offspring and with this, on this uh, little on this uh, multi multi electrode system and uh, improving and wanted to do one one set they say we cannot sell this one because it's too complicated to build and to sell and everything so and afterwards they were bought by Medtronic company mm -hmm. and uh, now other players like St. Jude's and, and Boston Scientific are sometimes more they have better engineers maybe better technicians better cooperation with neurologists or surgeons than Medtronic maybe for a couple of years so they may they are always various players in the field like when you look at this uh, business of ventricular shunting that's is very expensive in in the developed countries but uh, the so-called poorer countries brick countries they have uh, developed their own systems mm -hmm. and i wish they would also develop their own systems for deeper and simulation mm -hmm. which would fit their systems but what about right engineers in india wherever you, you go yeah. and they would be able to do so. And is China uh, not have, I know that you are very close to both India as well as China, as well as Pakistan. Uh, uh, and um, in uh, in China, are they still using the European system or do they have the, I, the engineer? Well, I, I, have, I have been in China many, many times. And uh, from what I've seen, they have usually, they have used uh, the European or American systems. Yeah, thanks. Maybe Thank they, are, they are also working, they're copying it, but I'm not quite sure about it. Thank you. So before I uh, uh, thank uh, Professor McDonough again, Professor McDonough, uh, you know, your, your foundation, uh, Professor McDonough, could you just uh, uh, let us know about your foundation and well, if you we can have, put your we website? Have made a found we have made a foundation, my family, uh, for neurosurgical research and intercultural communication. My wife, she's an interpreter for French and Spanish. And we have three children, so we put some money aside from our money, and uh, we said we should support neurosurgical research, and we should support intercultural communication, like starting with France between Germany and France, and uh, to make exchange to support exchange programs to re exchange uh, support research on different varying topics in neurosurgery, not only in Kiel but in, in Germany and also. Uh, France, we have some applications also from the United States even, and uh, they, these uh, grants, they are small grants only, but uh, it's, it's helping some people to get uh, rapidly get some money for some, for re some research projects and so on. So it's quite working, working quite well. Thank you, Prof. What's the website? I'll put it on the, on the chat box. Uh, uh, you just look at Medon, Medon Stiftung. I'll send you. I'll send oh, you brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Pro Professor McDonald. That was a fantastic lecture. A Lo lot of uh, pleasure. Um, messages on the on the uh, on the chat box on how everyone found it useful. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So now we go to our open papers. Uh, first of all, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, get uh, Dr. Nicholas um, 
uh, Sirmos from uh, Thessalonica, Greece, to um, uh, present us on radio eval radiological evaluation of lumbar and thoracic spine injuries in elderly male patients due to fall. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sirmos. Uh, good morning, everybody from uh, Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, uh, dear Naren, dear uh, organizing committee, uh, thank you for the acceptance of uh, my small papers. Uh, I, uh, I will share the screen now. Sure. Professor McDon, would you be able to um, uh, stop sharing then? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. That's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I am very happy, dear Naren, and very honored to, part to participate in this uh, marvelous uh, uh, mondial of the uh, of neurosurgery. Uh, great lectures and a great opportunity for uh, us, the young, uh, the young doctors, to uh, the young neurosurgeons across the whole world to participate. I uh, hope to see you my presentation. Is it okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I will present two papers, uh, two small uh, uh, neurosurgery, neurosurgical papers, but with uh, epidemiology evaluation and evaluation. The first is the radiological evaluation of thoracic and lumbar spine injuries in elderly male patients due to falls. Uh, the combination of uh, these injuries, lumbar and thoracic spine injuries, are serious traumatic situation. And the aim of this retro retrospective study was to present cases of uh, spine injuries of the lumbar uh, area and of thoracic area in male patients over 65 years old to, to falls. Uh, across Europe and uh, across the, uh, the whole West world, uh, we have uh, every day to, to focus and to treat uh, many people uh, over uh, the 65 years old. And according to the World Health Organization, this is the so-called third age. Uh, ten cases are presented in the study. Ten male patients uh, and the range of age was from 67 to 87 uh, years old. The mean age was 75. Uh, in all of them, we performed uh, CT and MRI studies. Uh, six uh, patients uh, had two level fractures and two level dislocation in the thoracic lumbar uh, junction. And uh, if we ask the masters of spine surgery, such as my friend Mehmet Zileli, Atul Goel, Salman Sarif, all friends of uh, also of Naren, uh, we, we have to be very accurate in our studies when we, we are. Uh, talking about thoracolumbar junction. Three of them had com combined lumbar and thoracic traumas plus cervical spine traumas. According to the O-spine, we have also, when we have a problem uh, in uh, thoracic and lumbar also to, to investigate the whole spine. And on one of them uh, had combined both leg and thoracic and lumbar traumas. This is the orthopedic point of view. We have also to evaluate also the length of the arms. Surgical treatment was performed in five cases, conservative treatment in other five cases. The good outcome is, uh, was uh, seven cases and the poor outcome in three cases. The management of spine injury in geriatric patients is still controversial. Uh, some, of the, some of the investigators, according to the literature, uh, have uh, severe opposition to perform surgical or uh, surgical intervention because we have to treat with persons that they don't have uh, good health. Uh, since patients often have uh, other associated injuries, sometimes also craniocerebral injuries or, or leg and arm injuries, these patients should be managed by a multidisciplinary team. Uh, spine trauma surgery, that is, is an autonomous specialty in the United States, but not in Europe. Neurosurgery and orthopedics. And if we manage to do well our job, and if God help us, uh, physical therapy. We have also to, uh, to get a consultation by other medical doctors, 
such as cardiology, internal medicine, and geriatrics. And this geriatrics may be the specialty of the future, and maybe also uh, we have to create also geriatric neurosurgery because we are treating so much people over 65 years old. The role of neuroradiology is essential to plan an optimal approach in uh, these cases. Naren may I continue in the second presentation and then we have a discussion. How 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 do you want to? Work? I think I think it will be good to have a discussion here. Okay. This one, okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, 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 Nicholas, if that's okay. Um, I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, one of our senior neurosurgeons in in the UK, uh, 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 he had been a geriatric. He had been a physician in geriatrics. Then uh, uh, he had seen, uh, he was so uh, dismayed how neurosurgeons treated the elderly. Then he resigned from the job and went back to surgery, trained as a neurosurgeon and became a very senior neurosurgeon. Maybe I should have invited him to come to this meeting. Um, so certainly I think the, the neurosurgery of the elderly, uh, I think in the new, as, as we move towards uh, this century, I think it's going to become more and more important. And because the elderly patients are actually functionally doing very well, as most of the leaders of our countries are well over 65. Um, and uh, is anyone, uh, certainly I think in uh, Japan, they have a quite a very well-fledged geriatric neurosurgery system. Uh, I have to confirm that. Um, if, uh, in, is, does anyone uh, in the in the audience, do you have a well-connected geriatrics with the neurosurgery uh, that the geriatricians do regular ward rounds to see elderly patients in your ward? Uh, if it is, please let me know. But uh, it's a, and uh, I presume that I think I asked you yesterday. I, I presume that this is not the case in in um, in Greece either, uh, Nicholas. Yes, uh, sometimes we have problems. Uh, per, per, perhaps, uh, per, per, per example, geriatrics is not an autonomous specialty in my country, Greece. But it's an autonomous specialty and very important uh, medical uh, discipline in other countries such as France, for example, and also in Italy, but uh, not so much uh, as, as uh, in France or in other places. But uh, we, we have, we have to, to have more disciplinary approach at some time to ask also the internal medicine uh, discipline if, if there is no uh, geriatric discipline autonomous. But it's very important because we have many, many patients. The most of our patients it is geriatric patients because uh, they are also over 65 years old and according to the World Health Organization, uh, very soon uh, they will change and over 60 years old will be considered such a person of a third age. And if we speak about golden age, over 85 or 90 years old, according to USA uh, bibliography references, we have to act, and we have to act uh, by a multidisciplinary approach and a multidisciplinary thought, I think. Personal opinion, I don't know if someone of the panel has other uh, comments to, to make. Sure. Um, I think... Um... The other thing is that uh, I think even the neurosurgical care of the elderly, I think uh, not only the medical side of uh, elderly that uh, the geriatricians could optimize, but I think I think you know if I were to organize another webinar, uh, I think uh, it will be on a two a weekend on 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 uh, neurosurgery for the elderly, how we can it, improve it, it that care. Very very interesting, uh, yeah. dear Narin, and if, if we invite people, as you mentioned before, that they are expert in this field. I think it is a good a, a good way for the future to to focus in the third age. Thank you. Thank okay. you. We will we'll think. Um, uh, and so, um, Nicholas, uh, do you want to go to your yes. next talk, uh, please? I, thanks. I have in, uh, uh, ready the, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Thank we you. will speak about depressive di disorders after uh, wish plus cervical injuries in young people from the third date now we, we, we will be moved in the young people. Uh, Naren, you know that uh, I'm interested also in young ages and also in pediatric 
uh, one because I made uh, my fellowship and a uh, big part of my, of my training in, uh, in pediatrics and in young adults. Aim of this study is to present cases of the depressive disorders after which plus cervical spine injuries in young people. Very common and a uh, very interesting topic, I think. Uh, six cases are presented. Uh, the range of age will be, was between uh, 18 and 30 years old, with mean age was uh, 25. All of them reported depressive disorders during the post-traumatic period after which plus cervical spine injuries. Mainly due to road traffic accidents. The road traffic accidents is very common in all the Mediterranean area, in all the whole world, but in all the Mediterranean area and in, in, in all of the Balkanic region, also the other Balkanic countries, have, uh, we have many road traffic accidents uh, due to, to high speed velocity, uh, no respect of the code of, uh, of the streets, of, uh, of driving uh, safe. And all of them, they receive appropriate neurological, psychiatric, and psychological rehabilitation. Very important, the psychological and the uh, uh, psychiatric rehabilitation. They manage both, all of them, uh, to have a good outcome after uh, six months follow-up, and they return uh, in the real, in the real, uh, in the life, and uh, also in the activity, professional activity. That is very important for the young people. And the development of depressive disorders, uh, such as anxia, disturbs during uh, the night and not good sleep, uh, remains a strong predictor of a variety of dysfunctions, social, personal, working, and other uh, ones. The emergence of depressive disorder in many cases remains unexplored and poorly understood. Uh, we have to focus uh, also in this. It's a very important uh, topic. The effect into the overall health it remains an, uh, the effect into the overall health remains a very important factor to investigate. And the combination and collaboration with the, various, the other various medical disciplines, such as uh, psychiatric and neurological, is essential to order and uh, to, to help to achieve uh, optimal results. I want to dedicate these two small presentations in my city, Thessaloniki, Greece the capital of Macedonia. We are focusing now very difficult days with coronavirus. We have a real uh, health problems. I put some uh, nice photos of, uh, uh, of, of the city and uh, I wish that uh, we will get out and we will manage to get out from this pandemic very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. I think um, you touched on two important areas uh, that has always historically been neglected in in society. One is geriatrics and one, one is psychiatric. The thing is that uh, in terms of this, these depressions that you mentioned, uh, do you think this was to do with the, you know, there's always this question that whether people with whiplash injury are feigning it for the insurance purposes. Uh, is that the case in, uh, in uh, Greece as well? Is there a secondary gain from uh, any uh, people feeling that they are not well big until the court case goes through? Uh, is there uh, that element? Yes. Uh, uh, you, uh, this is a very important uh, topic and thank you, dear Nara, for the question. We have always to have uh, to take into consideration also this medical, ethic, uh, medical, juridical uh, approaches. And uh, many times, uh, uh, despite the, the real disorders, many times we have also to... Uh, to take into consideration all, all, also the legal approaches and the, the legal things. It is very, it is very common. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, certainly uh, the, the the psychiatric problem, whether it's psychological or psychiatric, after any accident, is uh, is important. I know the mature world always says people people are just. Uh, either fading or people are just uh, uh, snowflakes. But I think, uh, once again, that's an important area that I think when we look at a patient-centric care, um, I think we should try to give a, uh, you know, how we, in pediatrics, we give a patient-centric care. We have got a neuropsychologist in our hospital. You know, if there's any worry, then we can refer for them to follow up. But certainly other areas could 
uh, benefit. As when I did adult surgery, I always said adults are just basically grown up children. So, uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much, Nicholas, for the two presentations. Well yeah, done. Thank, and thank you very much, Naren, for the opportunity. Greetings to all. Keep safe all, and especially greetings to your colleagues and my dearest friend for over 20 years uh, period, uh, Guri Solanke and Desiderio Rodriguez, and hope to see them and to see also you, dear Naren, soon uh, after the coronavirus, I will come and uh, visit you. This is for sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much, and uh, best wishes, and uh, good luck. Naren, you did a, a, great, a great job. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. There are some comments for you in the box. Um, so next presentation is coming from Turkey. Uh, microvascular decompression for hemifacial spasm. Our experience and uh, literature review from Dr. Serhat Pusat. Dr. Serhat Pusat, uh, uh, I'll just uh, let you share your... Okay, you should be able to share the presentation. Dr. Pusat? Yes. Dr. Pusat, can you hear me? I can't hear, sir. Oh, good. Excellent. Oh, good to see you there. Uh, do you want to share your presentation, please? Yes. Thank you. The system do not uh, permit share. Uh, okay, let me just... Uh, I'll, I'll set it again for you, just a second. Uh, how, what's your username? PC, is it okay? So that's why, sorry. PC, name okay, PC. Thanks. Okay, let's. Okay. PC, me. Okay, you should be able to do it now, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Sorry. No, you're doing fine. You can see your presentation just to maximize it or the presentation mode. That's it. Yes. Well done. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon. A great honor uh, attend for me uh, to meeting. I will uh, show you uh, or operated uh, senior author by senior author Ersin Erdogan, uh, hemifacial spasm and our experience uh, I show you. Emphasial spasm, you know, uh, is neuromuscular disorder, uh, prevalent, uh, no pay, painless and no sensory loss, uh, prevalence uh, 11 per 1000, generally observed uh, for middle age and affect women uh, more than men, uh, usually sporadic and uh, rare familial, rare bilateral, involuntary uh, as common cause injury, facial nerve, uh, any damage to this nerve might hinder to the communication of information resulting in uh, twitching or spasm. Uh, such damage may also occur due to development of tumor. In some cases, uh, isolated blood, blood vessel may pressure on the facial nerve. You know, uh, in the brain stem, the facial nerve originates at point of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. 
This arter uh, make us build up uh, of pressure on the facial nerve and result in abnormal contraction of the facial muscle. Uh, another probable cause of hemophagia spasm is condition known as Bell's palsy. Uh, Bell's palsy here the nerve which responsible for keeping a control on the facial muscle uh, get inflamed. Uh, that result uh, for hemophagia spasm. Uh, hemophagia spasm in the early stage uh, affected person experience contraction around the A. Uh, over time, the condition tends to spread to lower facial muscle, uh, including platysma. Uh, and the mouth seems to pull out one side. Uh, rarely start uh, buccal muscle and progress to the rest of the face, uh, and rarely uh, bilateral. However, the ansi fa facial expression may become a source of embarrassment in public, uh, and so will be withdrawal. We uh, will show uh, hemophysias spasm etiology. We distinguish etiology reason uh, primary and secondary. secondary. Primary region, uh, aberrant and ectatic vessel, mostly ica, pica, vertebral artery. Uh, secondary region uh, includes uh, cerebellopontin angel tumor, uh, acoustic neuroma, meningioma, epidermoid and arachnoid kist, lipoma. Uh, arteriovenous malformation, arteriovenous fistule, arterial aneurysm, and brainstem uh, lesion, uh, reason the emphasia spasm. Uh, diagnosis uh, mainly a clinical. The affected person may experience contraction around the eight. Uh, over time, the con con uh, contractions tends to separate the lower facial muscle. Motor tics uh, are involuntary, brief, repetitive. Uh, in diagnosis, we sometimes use electromyography. Electromyography, the rule of facial nerve lesion, resulting in denervation. Uh, and MR and MR uh, angiography is surgical in intervention being planned and need on. We and high spy uh, C seconds. We have used MR for diagnosis, but mostly we haven't seen MR uh, evident for vascular loop. We have found compressive uh, vessel loop during the posterior fossa surgery. Uh, hemifacial treatment, uh, oral medication, Botox injection and surgery are the three major treatment options for this condition. Surgical, uh, surgical option for the patient who either are not responding to medical treatment, botulinum toxin therapy, or prefer to option for a permanent cure for the condition. Procedure of choice uh, surgery, microvascular decompression. I show you uh, MEVD stage. MEVD stage, first of all, uh, position. Position, uh, supine or uh, park bench position. In supine position, we measure head angel, uh, angel between uh, the line drawn around the petrous bone, ventral to the internal auditory canal, and the uh, other line drawn parallel to the dorsal face of the clivus, and uh, measure angel uh, head position in supine. Uh, we uh, angel we turn the uh, other side. Uh, on the park page position, the neck is slightly flexed head is turned 10 to 20 degree from the affected side. Vertex uh, head turned to 10 to 20 degree towards the floor. Uh, and uh, incision, incision is vertical uh, and uh, located three uh, to five millimeter medial to the mastoid notch. Uh, incision approximately uh, base centimeter long. Uh, the, the incision is two thirds above and one third below mastoid notch. Uh, this is uh, important. We, uh, in that, we asterion point performant. We recognized after asterion point uh, the performant craniectomy. Craniectomy should extend uh, superiorly to the transverse sinus and laterally to the uh, sigmoid sinus exposed. Uh, and the matter opened. L shape, manner the three to five millimeter parallel to the sigmoid and transverse sinus. 
Uh, we haven't used retractor during surgery. We don't even use. Uh, we, facial nerve is visible in front of the eighth nerve, which is originally slightly inferior. Uh, that point, three or two millimeter uh, above the ninth cranial nerve. And facial nerve usually has a slightly gray coloration compared with the eighth nerve. Uh, senior author Professor Ersin Erdogan operated uh, 76 patients between two, uh, 2016 and 2020. We presented uh, 60 patients with follow-up from uh, 28 patients. Uh, in the slide show, show that uh, all cases and most common compression vessel, ICA and PICA. Uh, however, uh, we have case two or three vessels are, are compressed uh, over seri. Uh, when it comes uh, or uh, result uh, in this appearance in 25 patient disappearance, spasm disappearance, uh, 75%. In uh, seven patient, uh, se eleven person, uh, spasm finished within the one uh, postoperative period. In five, in the five patient market improvement of symptom, but it's not finished. And uh, three patient, there is no different uh, postoperative period in spasm. Uh, I will show. Uh, video, uh, very short video, uh, sir. Yep. Uh, after the, we, we don't have a, a retractor and we don't have a neuromonitor. Uh, after the cotonoid plate, uh, anti-gentle suction is used to remove CSF and relax the cerebellum, the sharp dissection and dividing the arachnoid, the cerebellum uh, gently elevated. You see eight and facial and facial sinus and uh, ICA. Sorry. The vessel uh, free of the nerve and uh, Teflon protest between the nerve and vessel. Another Teflon protest is between the vessel and nerve. The uh, Teflon page is not separated. We use uh, very tight uh, in, in our operation. And in situ craniopalasty uh, with closure, section. Thank you for, for everyone. Thank, thank you very much uh, uh, um, for this uh, very elegant presentation. Uh, 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 I know Dr. Yasin Erdogan for now about 20 years. He's a very good friend of the list service, steadfast friend, but an excellent uh, presentation. I, I, I see uh, Professor Doxy here. He's a skull-based surgeon. Professor Doxy, uh, if you can uh, come through your microphone, it will be good to hear from you on the presentation and on on your experience with hemifacial passing. Um, do, Doctor Doxy, can you hear me? Um, Professor um, Mahdon, did you do uh, hemifacial surgery for hemifacial spasm as well? Yes. Um, um, so, Doctor, uh, is Professor Ersin Erdogan there? Uh, Professor uh, Erdogan, uh, um, in terms of it's a difficult operation, uh, we don't get many cases in the UK. Uh, um, 
uh, certainly in, in my department where I trained, my senior consultant was very keen to do uh, surgery for hemifacial spasm, but we only got about one or two cases. But in Turkey, do you have more cases uh, in Turkey? Uh, actually, it's, it's, uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, I, I can, yes. Yeah, Naren, it's actually um, our center is, is uh, we have many, many patients, but most of the patients is, comes from the, um, actually, uh, after the uh, emphysiospasm medical treatment. But as you know, that medical treatment is not the exact therapy. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, curative therapy. Curative therapy should be performed by the surgically and we did uh, surgery. And also surgery is, is really, really good surgery and, and, and normal anatomy, you know, mm -hmm. and also it's really easy to perform. Mm -hmm. And after that, and, and, and the results also very good. And mm -hmm. it's nearly 90% uh, satisfaction rate is very, very good. Mm -hmm. and, and as a as, uh, complication rate, when you look to complication rate, we have no big complication. Mm -hmm. If you use permanent uh, retractor, Mm -hmm. you can have some problem for the hearing, for example, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the hearing nucleus is very close to the surgical area. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that reason, uh, you, we should perform surgery without using the uh, permanent uh, retractor. Mm -hmm. And you have, you have that c capability to perform the surgery in that, that way. And it's a very important point. And also you have, to, you, have to, you have to understand the exact anatomy of the um, of the uh, retrosigmoid area. And, and there are some, some tricks point, uh, which is very important for the perform uh, that kind of MVD and also uh, uh, and hemphysiospasm and also trigeminal neuralgia. I generally perform, I, I, I generally perform the craniectomy instead of craniotomy because craniotomy is not, is not appropriate for that area. And we, we should perform the craniectomy and I generally perform the craniectomy first burr hole. I open the dramata and I open the arachnoid. And at that time, for example, 20 minutes or 25 minutes, uh, we can get uh, CSF flow from the area. And after opening the dramata, we can, we can see the enormously relaxed uh, cerebellum. And it's very, I think it's a very important key point for the perform the, that kind of uh, surgery. For trigeminal neuralgia or or or, or hemphysiospasm, and also hemphysiospasm, you should you should uh, you should have not have to see the, the transverse sinus. You can you should see only uh, sigmoid sinus, and also you should have to see and at least half of the uh, sigmoid sinus. You should skeletonize the. Uh, um, uh, sigmoid sinus at the half of the sigmoid sinus. At that point, it's really good surgery. It's really easy surgery to perform uh, for the hemphysiospasm. Uh, thank you. In that two questions, just follow up questions uh, for those of us who don't do uh, microvascular decompression or hemifacial yeah. spasm. The learning curve for hemifacial spasm compared to microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia, which is uh, relatively easier. And what about the hearing? Uh, hearing uh, certainly with the MVDs for trigeminal neuralgia, at least the best is three person hearing problem. What about uh, from uh, for um, hemifacial spasm? For the uh, avoiding of the uh, hearing problem for the hemifacial spasm surgery. And actually first I saw, I, I thought that you should use the, um, you should not use the uh, retractor on a fixed mm -hmm. retractor. Mm -hmm. And also you, you have to know that the exact acoustic nucleus uh, plays uh, where the acoustic nucleus and also you should not touch uh, very hardly at that area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and First of all, you have to you have to understand the anatomy, and also uh, we we should not interest uh, we should not uh, make surgery around the seventh nerve, because the problem is is uh, just above the ninth nerve, mm -hmm. and touching the ninth nerve exit area for the seventh Excellent. nerve it's very important, and also you should put the pledged uh, pledged te teflon. At that area, I think the important point is that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions for uh, Dr. Pusat, uh, Professor uh, Erdogan? Uh, 
um, thank you thank you very much uh, um, uh, dr pusat pusnat pusat uh, that's a very clear presentation and professor erdogan thank you very much for uh, exposition uh, look forward to having you thank you very much um, i'm really grateful to dr ersin erdogan because uh, yeah, i actually last year i decided to do a and uh, i've done internet based conferences for 9 years uh, i started it before i started neurosurgery residency in 2013 um uh, we used the listserv and the web uh, powerpoints on the web and videos and then last year i had a, a webinar conference i had planned and um, obviously that was a time when still the world was in the normal one so but the first person the, who supported it was professor sin erdogan so thank you very much for all your support thank you sir um so now it brings my uh, brings me the uh, to the next presentation it's uh, from uh, dr noor ul huda maria from lahore pakistan she's going to talk to about the important area uh, uh, about the spina bifida in pakistan and how it might be uh, addressed thank you dr uh, um uh maria uh thank you so much sir first of all i'm really obliged and honored to present at this platform so i'm really uh, thrilled excited and deeply honored and moved as uh, so i'm thank you so much for giving me this privilege of sharing my work very humble work indeed uh, but i'm happy that it's an important topic to discuss so today i will be discussing about the incidence of spina bifida in pakistan and the need to consider food fortification uh, strategy um as we all know we are from developing part of the world and we do not have uh, as much uh, research papers as there should be there hasn't been much data regarding that but whatever data we could collect and we could do our research on our own as well as in collaborations uh, is uh, i will be happy to share the objective of the study is to know the incidence of spina bifida in pakistan in order to assess the gravity of situation and propose food fortification in order to decrease this risk the methodology was based on institutional based registered data from the leading hospitals with neurosurgical facilities and a literature review as well 230 registered cases of affected infants were studied 80 was 80 adults were also enrolled to study for equal effects and 10 studies were reviewed from different such uh, neurosurgical centers from all over pakistan the incidence of entities was found to be 7 to 8 per thousand live births and 35% of them were spina bifida the incidence of spina bifida occulta has been found to be 25% 97% were located in the lumbar sacral region female to male ratio was found to be 1.2 to 1 44.5% had an overt hydrocephalus on the presentation 85% survived one year and 75 to 71% survived to two years not much data on the long term survival was found this by that 2.1% had a history of an affected sibling and parents of 45.3% cases were cousins that is consanguineous marriages this is quite common in pakistan uh management offered um unfortunately we only provide surgical care and we do not have much antenatal care at all um in areas most many of the areas do not have that reach so we what we get in our centers is basically the infant with the spina bifida in pakistan there are large neurosurgical dedicated neuropediatric neurosurgical centers all over pakistan the major cities including lahore karachi islamabad uh, sagoda faisalabad and gujranwala and there are other centers that are working quite dedicatedly the center where i work is a natal neurosurgical center and what we is the infants who are being born in the obscure instances um, and we are basically at the neurological center but we do get these cases because the pediatric uh, hospital the pediatric neurological hospital in lahore is already quite overwhelmed so sometimes our obscure department send those patients who have been delivered in their departments to us and most of the time we try our best to operate them within 48 hours that is the best time duration most of the adult uh, neurosurgeons are well but with the surgery although we do not get that much in the, in our uh, setup still we are do that our center received uh, all the fatty new receptors was at preferably operated within 48 hours a post operative wound infection rate of about 14.2 Mercen was found and 24.1% suffer from CSF leak so that's a very high ratio 
The ideal setup, uh, basically what I want to hear tell is uh, how can, how we actually can prevent this anomaly. How can we increase the quality of life uh, by just a simple, man, a simple uh, strategy of food fortification. In Pakistan, there is a lack of awareness in parts of, uh, of patients and the parents. And people do not know that a simple uh, folic acid uh, supplementation can prevent um, about 51% of spinal bifida cases. You know, we can just reduce the disability incidence and the prevalence of disability in our in our country with just a very 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 little uh, strategical point with just a little intervention by food fortification which is being performed in 67 countries around the world and it is very cheap and it is very good and uh, i do think that it is something that is very neglected in our setup that that should be raised, that should be highlighted so that it can be done and we can, we will be able to prevent a lot of uh, disabilities, a lot of morbidity, a lot of mortality. We can give a high quality to, and we can give hope um, by bringing um, uh, this incidence to a much lower level than it is right now in our country. So the level at which intervention in the form of folate could be the most useful is the most neglected one, that is the prenatal and the antenatal services. Most of the low middle income countries have no specific provision of folate in the form of food fortification. Folic acid tablets are being provided by the lady health workers, which are community-based lady health workers, but the population covered by them is very limited. They have only a few areas that they cover. They usually go door to door and just uh, look forward for all those women who are expecting or in the childbearing age, and they usually try to um, make awareness campaigns among those and uh, provide folate uh, uh, tablets to the women who are expecting. But basically, they do have a limitation of um, their area. They do have a very limited area. Not all areas have been really um, covered by them, and not everyone allows them to visit their homes as well. So there is a lot of lack of awareness in, our, in the part of our, our people. And it is services are lacking in many peripheral areas as well. So the incidence of needle tube defect is still high in Pakistan. Although in the last 10 years, there is, has been a um, decreased incidence in only the urban areas where more educated people reside and have awareness. But still, uh, all over Pakistan, because um, there is a lot of population here, so still the incidence is on the rise. This has led to an increase in psychological issues as well, and that's very, uh, I, I, I really feel for that we should that's with that thing. And this is something that I again want to say that it could be prevented very easily. Uh, these individuals also suffer from several complications, namely urosepsis, tethering of cord, VP shunting complications, and multiple surgeries and bed sores. A stitch in time, yes, it's three, there's a stitch in time. Uh, full lace supplementation is a key point in the prevention of neural tube defects. There's a dire need to spread awareness regarding the prevention of NTDs. There's a dire need to provide antenatal counseling to parents who are planning to raise a family. Parents who already have history of an effective pregnancy are at a special risk. They need to be counseled and the mother should be provided a higher dose of four milligram folic acid tablet. Uh, a dose for other ones is point four only. These pregnancies need proper screening as well. Baby so we're taking well prior acid are an increase risk of entities and this is very important and it's very so this should be kept in mind whenever you are um, prescribing anti-black drugs to women who can potentially wear a bear a child later. There is a need to address the culture of consanguineous marriages, which are a huge social problem in Pakistan. The need of food fortification, the provision of folate for every woman of childbearing age is possible only by food fortification at national level. It is estimated that the incidence of neural tube defects can be reduced to about 51% by this strategy. 67 countries around the world have reduced this incidence by food fortification only. It is just as what you mentioned. You can do it very easily. According to the CDC, the USA was able to save 400 to 500 more million dollars per year by reducing entities incidents which is employing the strategy of food fortification. Pakistan is not included in, in the 67 countries with fortified food with folic acid. You can see it in, in this map how many countries are uh, performing the strategy um, through either wheat flour, rice, wheat flour and maize flour, wheat flour and rice and wheat flour and, and you can see this is very easy to look at. The impact of folic acid is the CDC um, own index that has been shared here. The stats that they have shared the folic acid has been added to food label as enriched, such as the bread, pastures, rice, and cereal. This has led to 600,000 babies born without a spinal bifidal defect each year. That results in about a 400 to 600 million dollars saved each year. 
with the United States with, with, this, with such a little uh, intervention. There are two non-governmental organizations in Pakistan who are trying to uh, raise awareness for this issue. This is the IPS7, the Spina Bifida Foundation. They try to arrange campaigns and uh, awareness campaigns. And also they have posters all over Pakistan in various colleges. They just go and paste those posters and try to do programs and do videos, uh, load videos and share videos uh, to raise awareness. There are support groups as well. The Wheel Model Pakistan, which is being formed by a, a young man, a young boy um, who has suffered from spina bifida, who is uh, who cannot walk at all, he's wheelchair bound, and he's trying to share his views along with several other uh, spina bifida uh, survivors, the patients who have suffered from spina bifida who have been operated and who cannot walk at all. They are all wheelchair bound, but they are very brave and they are doing wonderful things in life. They are very well educated, very brilliant kids, but uh, sadly they are, cannot walk, of course, because of this reason. So we conclude that the incidence of spina bifida is high in Pakistan, which is a country amongst those who do not fortify food. It is time to raise awareness and highlight the need to fortify food, arranging awareness campaigns, providing antenatal and prenatal care, and proper counseling for future pregnancies is really important. There's a need to address the culture of consanguineous marriages as well. I think the social media can um, be very helpful in raising this awareness and propagate this message, as well as some uh, media uh, initiatives that could be taken as easily. So thank you so much. Much. This is a picture of an intrauterine surgery uh, of a patient with a, of a baby uh, with a fetus with spina bifida. Uh, this is not available in our country at all. This has been performed in only a few centers around the world, and this is just, uh, it is a very promising technique indeed. Thank you so much for listening to me, and thanks for your kind consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Noor Ul Huda. Uh, once again, excellent presentation. Uh, you bring an important point, and I think uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar, uh, Dr. K Dr. Sharma from Nepal also um, talked to us yesterday about spina bifida in Nepal. Um, it's uh, I know that it's difficult to fortify food in Pakistan, and I come from originally from Sri Lanka because the foods are, uh, you know. The, the you know people make their own food we are not so much dependent on on bread and that and this from the uh, supermarket which uh, give food from a uh, big companies so it's always uh, difficult in terms of uh, uh, does the uh, does the neurosurgical society of pakistan or the, do you have a pediatric neurosurgery society in pakistan i'm sure they have got many things to do yeah. but um, do you have a, a pediatric society there yet Unfortunately, we do not have a pediatric neurosurgery society. Even in the FCPS program, they have not added it as a special. Hello? Hello? Yes. Are we? Don't worry, uh, no, it's just the probably the delay. The, the internet is connecting slow. Um, so I think uh, I think uh, um, I think you, know, you have to, in a very gentle way. It's difficult uh, to persuade uh, the people in the top. Uh, and neurosurgery is actually a small small part of the whole ecosystem. Um, so, uh, but you know, you you keep at it, and uh, uh, I think social media now can probably reach more places. Okay. And I think I think you know, uh, get your bosses involved and try to get one of your big personalities to help you with a promotional, uh, promotional, and then you can have a great reach. Uh, any questions for Doctor Doctor um, Noor Ul Huda Maria? Uh, so well done, uh, Doctor Huda. Uh, you know, Thank once you. again, fantastic talk. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. So um, we are coming to the conclusion of the morning session. We had a very good um, presentations, free pre presentations from uh, from Greece, uh, from Turkey, and from Pakistan. And we had that fantastic lecture from Professor uh, Mahdoun. All the sessions have been recorded on the YouTube. So uh, I will put that link. So you know all the lectures from the day one has been there. It will take me another year to index them all. But certainly you can jump and uh, have a look at it uh, wherever the talks are. The main thing of this uh, conference was 
uh, for me to bring uh, uh, residents and uh, junior uh, consultants to present because the way we have had webinars in the COVID period and this has mainly been for the senior or you know pretty much like the rock stars of neurosurgery and the aim of this one was to give a uh, opportunity for uh, 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 residents and junior doctors to present, uh, uh, junior consultants to present their work, and also to break the mold so that the other societies, I'm sure, in 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 2021 will have regular conferences. On the side, on the chat box, I have put the link to um, Professor Magdon's family uh, foundation, which is. Um, uh, which gives grants and please have a look at it. And I know it's always difficult to get money to get your project started, but it's worth, uh, worth uh, please looking at uh, Professor McDonald and his family's uh, um, philanthropy. Um, so we will um, meet in, uh, in, uh, in 30 minutes. We have got a fantastic uh, uh, late morning session. We are starting off with Professor Miguel Arath, um, he's a fantastic uh, neurosurgeon uh, who's going to give us a lecture on uh, on adult brainstem tumors. Uh, he's the former president of the Spanish Neuro Society and uh, currently the chairman of the foundation of the WFNS. But I have visited his department and I've seen his surgery. It's, it's just uh, you know you will uh, you will really find it useful. We also have at the uh, just have a look. Uh, uh, we have got uh, presentations from Kenya um, and also uh, from Brazil uh, and uh, Pakistan, and then we'll finish finish the morning uh, for lunchtime uh, with the neurophysiology for brain surgery from uh, Dr. Dimitrios. So we have got an exciting pro program ahead. So 30 minutes to get your tea break and coffee and stretch your legs and see you all soon. Thank you very much.